If you have a Bible handy, grab it with me. We're in the book of Psalms, uh, studying through the Psalms, obviously, together uh, here, and uh, need you to have a Bible handy or just kind of open up the app on your phone, whatever uh, is your convenient way to get to God's Word. We're in Psalm 34, uh, but love for you just to backtrack with me into the book of First Samuel. Could you find... 1 Samuel with me, Uh, chapter 21 is the backdrop of of why and when Psalm 34 is written, and uh, the landscape here really changes uh, of the heart and the meaning and all that we together today will glean and grow to appreciate Uh, that is said to us in Psalm 34. Psalm 34 declares to us, uh, many in the room watching online, some of our absolute favorite verses in the book of Psalms are here in Psalm 34. Um, But I think even in saying that, we miss out on, on on the beauty and the full appreciation of what David is saying uh, if we miss the context, it's all about context, and I want you to see it in 1 Samuel chapter 21. Now, the first half of that we've already looked at together. David's on the run. He's being hunted. Saul is after him. Serious business wants to destroy him, wants to kill him, and you have an enemy that would love to see you destroyed as well. And so this, this all pertains to our life and not just his. Don't be looking at it like, some archaic Old Testament, old-fashioned historical record. This is relevant for us. You have an enemy that seeks to destroy you. And so here David's on the run. You know where he runs to? Where does he run to? He runs to church. Good on you for being here. Bless you for being in church today. He runs to church in 1 Samuel 21. He's starving. He hasn't eaten in a long time and he's he like meets with the priest and he's like, do you have any food? Do you have any, do you have any bread? And, and that, that, that priest, that particular church, wasn't actually doing a fundraiser for their youth ministry. They weren't serving the hot dogs and the hamburgers that many people actually just devoured at 1020 in the morning. They went nuts for it. Our whole youth staff right now is racing to the grocery store to refill and replenish because you're all going to be starving when we get out of here. None of that was going on in the church that David visits in 1 Samuel 21. The only thing that was going on was the show bread, was the communion bread. And the priest is like a little reluctant. I'm not sure I can serve it to you. And David's like, look, dude, I'm starving. It's okay. Serve it up. And the, and the priest's like, I've never done this before. This bread is consecrated. And David's like, so am I. And, uh, and gets a good stomach full of food for the first time in a long time. 1 Samuel 21. While he's eating that meal, his second question to the priest, first question, do you have any food? Second question, do you have any weapons? And uh, again, the priest is sort of like, not really our department. We, we don't, actually we do, the priest says. We have the sword of Goliath that you brought us. And David, munching on the communion bread, says, bring it on. It would come in handy right about now. This Saul guy is crazy nuts to destroy me. I'd love to have that sword over my shoulder. And so now, with the sustenance of a meal that he's received from church, a sword that is now over his shoulder, a sword of victory that he remembers now. It's amazing where he goes. Look at verse 10. It's absolutely incredible where he chooses to go. Look at this. 1 Samuel 21, verse 10. You got it? Say, got it? Okay. Then David arose and fled that day from before Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. What? He went where? Everyone say this. Say this out loud. Say, choose your poison. Choose your poison. He goes to the land of the Philistines. 
He goes to the king of the Philistines. He goes to Goliath's hometown. Goliath was from Gath. And I don't know if this sword now, the sword of Goliath that is over his shoulder is giving him any like navigational insights as to, I don't know, I think maybe I'll leave Saulville. <laughs> I'll get out of Israel where Saul's seeking. I'll take my chances over there in the land of the Philistines where the guy who used to carry this sword, the guy who I chopped his head off, I'll go over there to downtown Gath and meet up with the king over there of the Philistines. And the servants, verse 11, of Achish said to him, is this not David? What's he doing here? Is this not, is this not David, the king of the land? And do they not sing, like this was the top song of the day, this was the hit, do they not sing of him to one another in dances, saying, Saul has slain his thousands, David his ten thousands. And David took these words to heart, and he was very much afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. So, everyone say so. Look what happens. So he changed, look at verse 13. He changed his behavior. Okay, this is where we're going to camp out today. This is where we're going to talk about a little bit. He changes his behavior. Quite literally, he goes crazy. He changes his behavior before them and pretends madness. He's like, oh, I've already been recognized. I thought I could be totally incognito here in the land of the Philistines. I thought I would fit in with this big sword. But they've already, they've already ID'd me. They've already, they're singing the same hit song here that they're singing over there in Saulville. Saul is slain his thousands. David is tens of thousands, and he changes his behavior, goes crazy, pretends madness in their hands, scratches on the door. I mean, goes like full Manson. He's just sort of like scratching on the doors, scribbling on the doors. Look what it says. Saliva falling down his beard. He's just like spitting and, 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 and saliva. Like, now the beard, I could have shaved today, but the beard is fitting in so well with this sermon. He's just like disrespecting it. The beard was respect in that culture. And he's just showing complete disrespect as he's just allowing, you know, for all sorts of saliva to be falling down his beard. And then Achish said to his servants, look at this, look at this response in verse 14. Look, you see this man is insane. Question, why have you brought him to me? Why is he here? Second question, even better, verse 15. Have I need of madmen? That's he's like, I'm doing well in this category. The king of Achish simply sort of acknowledges. He's like, do I need another madman? Do I need another crazy guy in my life? Have I need of madmen that you have brought this fellow to play the madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? Okay, this is a breaking point for David. It's like, how, how long are we going to go along with the crazies? Because if you haven't noticed, it's getting crazy out there. It's totally getting crazy out there. Evil is now being celebrated as if it's good, especially this month. And good is being pressed down and shunned away from as if it is evil. And it's getting crazy. It's getting totally crazy. I had a, a pastor on my staff tell me last night that it was just voted and approved in the state of Washington. Like that's, okay, Washington's gone totally crazy. That if you, you, if you have the reds and blues of a patrol car uh, and siren sort of fla flashing you down because of something you did, now has been approved in the state of Washington, you don't have to pull over. 
You don't have to respond any, I'm not making it up. You don't have to respond if the reds and the blues of the police who are behind you are trying to get your attention to get you to pull over. You can totally ignore it because of the so-called threat that the law enforcement has now perceived to become in that state. You can totally ignore How's this going to go? Nor are they responding any longer to rape charges that aren't involving a minor. How, how's this going to work out? In fact, the Bible says in the last days, lawlessness will abound. And the love of many will wax cold. Like conscience has been seared with an iron, we're told. And it's as if, it's as if here in, in, in 1 Samuel, things have gone nuts. Things have gone absolutely crazy. And I think what's happening is this. There is this, there's this manifestation that how David is feeling on the inside is how he's acting out externally. He is like filled with fear, he's stressed out, he's worried, he knows Saul's out to hunt him, and he's like, I'm going to take my chances over in, 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 in the fiercest known enemy to Israel over in the camp of the Philistines. I'm going to see how it goes over there. And they're like, what's David doing here? Why is this guy acting all crazy and everything? Do I need another crazy guy in my life? Is the response of the king. And so it becomes a turning point in David's life. And it's in that situation he now runs to a cave. Look at the beginning of chapter 22. And David therefore departed from there, from the Philistine camp, from, from the palace and presence of Achish the king, and, and, and escaped to the cave of Adullam. It's still there. You can visit it if you fly into Ben Gurion Airport in Tel Aviv and are making your way up the hill to Jerusalem. The caves of Adullam are just off the highway. They're still there. Here he escapes to the cave of Adullam, back now in Israel, back in Saulville, but hiding out in a cave, in a deep, dark, damp cave, so that when his brothers and his father's house hear of it, they went down there to him. They went to check on him like David Here's sort of like full circle. When David was told by his dad, I want you to go check on your brothers. They're fighting with the Philistines. And there's this big giant Goliath. Would you just go check on him for me? And now the favor is returned, right? As those same brothers now hearing that David's in sort of a, a tough spot. He's externally acting out how he is perceiving himself internally and he's just acting like a madman like straight up stark raving lunatic and they're like this isn't normal for our brother David we should go check on him and they go down and check on him and here he is in the cave of Adullam and not only do they come look at verse 2 and everyone who was in distress look at look at this grouping Everyone who was in distress, everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was discontented also gathered to him, so he became captain over them. Do you see that in your Bible? He becomes captain of the crazies. <laughs> guys that are crazy in debt, guys that are crazy in distress, somehow share an affinity with how David has has recently been acting, guys that are just filled with discontentment, and he becomes, he is now, here's your hashtag, raising crazies. And he's like thinking to himself, he's sort of like, um, what am I going to do with this troop? And ultimately this troop becomes David's mighty men. But here's how it starts. It starts crazy. But it's at this moment that he has to decide who he is and whether he's going to just go along with how crazy the culture around him is getting and whether or not he's going to let fear and the hooks of fear, the grips of fear, steal the, 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 the seeds of, of, of righteousness and faithfulness in his heart and in his life. This is David. This is the man after God's own heart. This is a story that, that, that doesn't reflect him well. This is one if you were going to sort of like 
bleach clean the scriptures, the story probably would have been left on the editing room floor. And yet it's from this story that we learn so much, you guys, into what we're allowing to shape our character and who we're going to be as, as men with a lot of eyes that are watching us as leaders in this community, who we're going to be as women, what we're going to be known for in these, in these last days. And it is this pivotal moment where the storyline changes for David and in the cave, here with a group of crazy guys that are in over their head financially, in debt, in distress, and discontent, he has to decide who am I going to be? Am I going to just keep scratching on the walls and, and drooling down my beard? Or am I going to rise to the occasion with a heart that is full on out to look to the Lord even in my most difficult hours? And it is at that moment that he pins for us the 34th Psalm. Look at Psalm, look at Psalm 34. Look what he says. Right out of the gate, what's he say? What's the first thing that he declares? to this group of 400 guys in the cave. What, 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 what's he say? Incidentally, look at the beginning of, 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 of Psalm 34. This isn't like added later. This wasn't added like by the, the publishers, you know, and everything. This is scripture. It says, it's the Psalm of David when he pretended madness before Abimelech who drove him away and he departed. And here's the first thing he says with these guys in the cave. He says, I will bless the Lord when? When, church? at all times and his praise shall his praise shall what what continually be in my mouth and my soul shall make its boast in the lord and the humble shall hear of it and be glad oh oh magnify what does that mean it means make it big Go big. He's like saying to these 400 in debt, in distress, discontent, guys in a cave, guys, it is time to go big. Go big or go home. It's time for us to decide who we're going to be. And here's who we're going to be. We're going to magnify the Lord. We had a celebration of learning in here this week. It's how we wrap up our school year. And Scott was here, and Rick was here, and Matt was here, and all of our admin was here, and all of our teachers who do such a spectacular job, and all of our students were here, and all of our students recited for memory Psalm 139. And I'm thinking to myself, you got other schools that are memorizing genders and pronouns. That's crazy. I cramming sex ed down preschoolers' throats. And our kids are reciting from memory the 139th Psalm, and I couldn't have been more proud and grateful to God for the school that we have, which is an extension of the ministry of this church. And my grandson is with me. I'm sitting back there, and he's got binoculars. He got binoculars for his third birthday. And, and, and it's like he's trying to figure them out, and sometimes they're upside down. And, 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 but when he got them right, he would respond. When he got them right, he would be like, whoa. Because all of a sudden, everybody on stage that was reciting the 139th Psalm was huge. And when, you know, when he got it backwards, they were like, you know, even further away, like five miles away. But when he got it right, he'd be like, whoa. And that's exactly what David is saying. He's saying, you're not making God bigger. You're making your perspective of God bigger. He's like, whoa. And he's like, it's time to go crazy in magnifying the Lord, exalting his name. He says this. He says in verse four, I sought the Lord and he heard me. This is written in David's deepest, darkest hour. Not when everything is like awesome in the market and everything is great in your life and, and, and you got your big vacation plan and the gas prices have come down and you're sitting on a beach somewhere. No, he's in a cave. And he's like, no, 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 you know what? I sought the Lord and he heard me and he delivered me from, from all my fears. 
So don't for a second ever buy into this notion that, no, David never, David never was afraid. I mean, David's like, before Goliath, man, I can just knock him. He's, he's freaking out, filled with fear right now. And he says, with all of my fears, this is an absolute transition point and shift in David's storyline. He's like, he's, like, he's like, what am I going to do with all my fears? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to seek the Lord with them. I sought the Lord and he heard me and he delivered me from all my fears. Look at Psalm 56 just for a second. Just for, keep, your, keep your finger in 34. We've got a ways to go here and we're going to celebrate the greatest meal of all meals. But in Psalm 56, so clutch and important is this Dramatic change in the, in the trajectory of David's life? Is he going to just continue to go down some crazy route? Or look at Psalm 56. To the chief musician set to the silent dove in distant lands. Anyone know that song? Must have been a hit at the time. The silent dove in distant lands. A victim of David when the Philistines captured him in Gath. And he's like this, he's saying the same thing in Psalm 56, look at verse 3. Whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. In God, I will praise his word. In God, I have put my trust. I will not fear. What can flesh do to me? All day they twist my words, their thoughts are against me for evil. They gather together, they hide, they mark my steps. And when I lie and wait for my life, shall they escape by iniquity and anger? Cast down the people, O God. You number my wanderings. He'd been, he'd been wandering around on the run. Look at this. You put my tears into your bottle. Are they not in your book? And when I cry out to you, my enemies, I'll turn back. This I know because God is for me. That's what he's declaring here. He's like, this is what now, and he's like speaking to all these guys. He's like, guys, this is now who we're going to be. This is who we're called to be. This is who we have to be. This is who we're called to be in these last days. This is who we have to be. Back to Psalm 34, he's talking to himself. I think it's a bit of a pep talk that David's given himself. Look at this, look at verse six. This poor man cried out. Here's my translation. This poor crazy guy talking to himself he's looking in the mirror this poor man he's got 400 in debt discontent nut jobs looking at him right now like who are you going to be what kind of leader are you going to be he's like this poor crazy guy cried out and the lord heard him that's my testimony along with david's this poor crazy guy cried out and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. And the angel, look at verse 7, the angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. Now look at that angel right there is singular, it's not plural. If you're into guardian angels, God bless you, but why are you settling for that when you have the angel, singular a angel with the capital A. If you're like believing in guardian angels and still praying to priests, knock it off. Why in the world would you settle for that when you can call on the name of the Lord Most High, the angel of angels, and he, not plural, singular, encamps around all those who give him that respect. That's what it means. Who fear him and will deliver them. Oh, Taste and see that the Lord is good. And that's what, that's what David is discovering. That's what he's realizing. He's realizing he's got to continue to be one who lives by faith instead of by sight. Because sight would reverse the verse. I want, I want, to, I want, to, I want to see what I'm eating before I taste it. Well, that's not how the verse reads. The verse reads, taste it and then see. That's exactly what he says to Doubting Thomas. Doubting Thomas is like, well, I ain't going to believe it until I see it. 
And the Lord says, blessed are those having not seen who believe. Where's your faith? Our faith. Has our faith in this pandemic season of two and a half years been drowned out by, by our fears, by our stress, by our worry, by the one like in David's life is Saul that seeks to destroy us because greater is he that's in us than he that's after us. Amen? Amen. He's like, I, I've learned this, guys. I've learned to taste and see, to walk by faith, to put him first in my life and see that he is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Fear the Lord. He's like, I, I've got fear. I've got some misplaced fears. They've been getting the best of me. They've been driving me crazy. And what brings them into a proper perspective is not allowing my fears to be bigger than my God. And the way that happens is by giving God the reverence and respect that he deserves. Fear the Lord, you his saints, for there is no want to those who fear him. you got to claim that verse with me today. There is no lack, there is no want to those who Who fear him. Look at the contrast, amazing contrast here in verse 10. The young lions lack. He's speaking of pride. He's talking about the king of the jungle. He's like, even the, the, and that's interesting during Pride Month. You should never be proud of anything that the Bible calls sin. And here he says, even those prideful king of the jungle lions, they lack and they suffer hunger. But those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Hallelujah. What a word for us today. Come, you children, listen to me, and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who's the man who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil. He's like, here's who we're going to be, guys. Rallying the troops and we're exiting out of this cave. And here's how we're going to live. We're going to keep our tongue from evil, our lips from speaking deceit. We're going to depart from evil. We're going to do good. We're going to seek peace and pursue it. He's like, who's with me in these these. These, these, these wing nuts, these guys are like in stress, like in debt. This is a life-changing moment for them. They're like, we're with you. And, and they become a mighty force to be reckoned with. They are David's mighty men. We're going to depart from evil. We're not going to speak evil. We're going to drop the drama The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry, and his face is against those who do evil. To cut off the remembrance of them from the earth, the righteous cry out, and the Lord hears. This is what David has just now experienced. The goodness of the Lord in his deepest, darkest, craziest moment the righteous cry out and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles the Lord is near I love this verse look at verse 18 the Lord is near to those who have a broken heart like you Valley Texas and like Buffalo New York and like Tulsa Oklahoma he is near to those who have a broken heart and he saves such as have a contrite spirit He never hears a thing that the proud heart says. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He guards all his bones and not not a single one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked and those who hate the righteous shall be condemned. Here's a verse. Here's a verse for 2022. How about this? For the second half of this year. Look at verse 22. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants. And that's what these guys in all of their debt and discontentment leave the cave to become. They leave the cave to become the Lord's servants. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants. And none of those, none of those who trust in him shall be condemned. What? 
What an incredible song that comes out of his craziest moment. He's redeeming crazy. He's like, the world's gone crazy. I might as well act crazy. I'm feeling crazy inside. It's all gone crazy. And he comes out of it. I think he comes out of it realizing that the noise and drama of a crazy, chaotic world has been drowning out the voice of God. And maybe that's been the case for some in this room for the last several years. The noise of culture. Like, what has driven David to a place where now he is just like acting totally schizo? I think what drives anyone to that place of just putting on this much of a crazy dramatic stunt is he's run out of Q-tips. If you've been in our series, he has lost those Q-tips, those quality time with God to allow his voice to speak into our circumstance. He has somehow lost that. His Q-tips have run out and his hearing aids are turned off. And the result is, as, as a result, he is now filled with fear. He's not filled with peace. He's filled, he's filled with, he's on the run. He's isolated. He's stressed out. He's worried. He's, he's in a deep, dark place of depression. He's acting like a stark, raving lunatic. And he snaps out of it. With the, with the help that has come from his family and these, these new band of brothers, these friends, and, 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 and what results is a crazy change in behavior. And the storyline shifts from this moment on, and he chooses a greater crazy. And I think he does it in four ways. Real quick, if you're a note taker, four ways in which he chooses a greater crazy. Right out of the gate, he says, I'm going to bless the Lord at all times. For some of you in the room right now, that's crazy. Because our praise has still remained situational and circumstantial. It's optional. And the moment your faith is optional, it's no longer faith. I love the way Hebrews 11 begins. Hebrews 11 begins with the most classic definition of faith that you can find in Scripture. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. But how does it begin? How does it begin? Now, faith. Now faith. In other words, the faith that you had when you came to Christ in the Jesus movement of the 70s, as wonderful as that was, as glorious as those times were, some of you weren't even born yet, pardon me, that was your then faith. Where is your now faith? Because the moment your faith is a then faith, it's no longer faith. That's why Hebrews 11 starts by saying, now faith. Now faith is. Because the moment faith is optional is the moment your faith is no longer faith. And, 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 and so he determines right out of the gate to be one who is going to praise at all times. I'm not gonna, in other words, I'm not going to allow this chapter of craziness that he has just gone through in 1 Samuel chapter 21 to ever be something he goes through again, a line in the sand. And a determined change in his storyline. He's like, I am going more public. Listen, here's what he says. I'm going to magnify the Lord. And he invites us to join him in this crusade. He's like, I'm going more public and I'm going more passionate in my praise. And, and, and here's the thing for some of us. I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you with all my heart. Hear this in love. You're holding back. You're holding back in your praise. You're like, maybe, okay, let's all raise our hand and give the Lord the glory, he deserves. you know, because we were like raised Catholic or we were somehow duped into some Episcopalian sophistication, you know, or it's like, Presbyterian baptized in lemon juice, and I'm just like <laughs> very stoic in my, he's like, I'm going to praise the Lord at all times, and his praise is going to continually be on my lips. Listen to me, Horizon. It's time for you, with your praise and worship, 
to get crazy. You do it on Wednesdays. You do. Bond's in the theater with the women on Wednesday, and she's like, gals, what is up? Because in here, without the intimidation of the male species, you're like, what? Just giving the Lord glory and praise. She's like, where's that on Sundays? And she's like, by the way, the guys are all in here on Wednesday night, and the guys, the same thing, are making a joyful noise, just giving the Lord glory. But then we gather together on a Sunday, and everybody kind of clams up a bit. And the way to keep the faith alive so that it's a now faith instead of just a then faith or a sometimes faith or a fluctuating faith, or a private faith. Well, my faith is private. It is not anywhere in Scripture what you are called for your faith to be. It is to be out loud. It is to be blessing the Lord at all times. And I don't know, maybe we could just try for a moment. How about like for just five seconds, you pretend it's Wednesday, and give Him praise in this house, church. Can you give Him some praise? I mean, come on, a shout to the Lord. I knew you had it in you. He says, I will praise the Lord at all times. And for some of you, that seems crazy and a little bit undignified. Oh, you haven't even begun to see undignified like in a couple of chapters when the Ark of the Covenant finally that has been kidnapped by the Philistines returns to Jerusalem. David raises the roof on praise, which is exactly how praise will be in heaven. And this is simply meant to be the rehearsal of getting us in tune and ready for eternity to give him praise. Some of you right now are like bummed by that. You're like, I don't really want. This is our moment to magnify the Lord, make him big in your heart. I love what Paul says in Ephesians 6. He says, don't be drunk with wine, which is dissipation. Here's, here's his analysis. Here's his comparative analysis. Don't be drunk with that, the fake stuff, the small spirits, the small S in spirit, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And that, that, that means just bubbling, or just gushing out. In other words, he's like, be intoxicated with praise. Be one who is standing out. I give you permission. And whoever it is that pulls up next to you at the stoplight and just kind of witnesses you giving continual praise to the Lord, so be it. May it run contagious through North County. May people see and hear that you are a people purposed to give him praise 24-7. Amen, church? This is where he goes. And that might, sound, that, that might sound crazy for some of you. This is a greater crazy. It's either that or you're just going to fit in to all of the craziness that surrounds you. Secondly, he plants his flag he, he, he chooses the premium position. That means it's not the cheap seats. The premium position of putting himself and, 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 and placing his life in the spot where God has to protect him and where God has to provide for him. That's what he says. That's Psalm 34. He's like shifting all of his chips, all of his eggs in one basket. He's saying, my premium position in life is to never outgrow my dependency upon God. And the place where I need to be, listen, please listen, North County. Oh, I know some of us, this sounds so crazy. Because you've got like stacks of a portfolio that are intended to protect you from ever needing anything from anyone. And yet I, 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 am, I am simply encouraging you to consider the fact that we can never outgrow our need for God's protection and provision. 
And that would be the scariest thing. In fact, that to me in this culture is the Antichrist. Where you're believing in a portfolio that you have built in your successes to protect you and the lineage of your family from ever being in a position of need. And David is like, ha! You have to put yourself in a spot where he becomes both your protector and your provider. Because one of these days, it will be you standing before the judge. We just watched this ridiculous court case play out for the last month. And you have the world's most lost guy up against the world's most mean girl. And actually, who had the best attorney is who won. Because they're both whacked. And one of these days, it'll be me, it'll be you, standing before the judge, giving an account for our lives. And you better hope in that moment that you got the best attorney in the universe. And that's exactly who Jesus Christ desires to be. In fact, that's how he's described by Isaiah. I know it only comes out on the Christmas cards, but his description for us is that he is a wonderful counselor. And a lot of us want to think that means shrink. And if you need one, let me save you five grand and bring your cares and concerns to Jesus. Bring them to Dr. Jesus. But that's not what Isaiah is describing. He's not describing your shrink. He's not describing, and Jesus is all of that. But what's being described by Isaiah is your defense attorney. will stand by your side when you face the judge. And say this debt has already been paid. This trial is over because the penalty and wrath has already been served. And you have to place yourself, whether you like it or not, whether you think it's crazy or not, in a position where your life is fully dependent upon him for your protection and provision both now and forevermore. Thirdly, I'm just pulling it out of Psalm 34. The third thing that keeps his faith alive and keeps his sanity about him instead of going crazy like everything around him is in verse 14. What's it say? It says he's going to depart from evil and do good. Well, everyone's doing evil right now. It's just a matter of time before the, 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 the nutcases in, 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 in the state of Washington that are deciding on those, those trickles down here through Oregon into California. It's gone nuts. But no, who's, who, who are we going to be? David's looking at all these guys. He says, here's who we're going to be. We're going to depart from evil and we're going to do good. We're going to seek peace and we're going to pursue it. He's like, I'm going to seek peace and I'm going to practice love with Every fiber of my being, guys, this is who we're going to be. And it's like the Holy Spirit is speaking to us right now. As crazy as crazy is getting out there, we are the people on the planet that are here to pursue peace and practice love. And the moment we stop is the moment we have lost our message. This is what makes Christianity radical. This is exactly what Paul was talking about in 1 and 2 Thessalonians. Now listen, church, we just studied 1 and 2 Thessalonians, and here's my fear. We are so quick to move on to the next book. Like, what's the next study? I can't wait for the next study. And we forget what we just learned. What did we just learn? Paul's writing in 1 and 2 Thessalonians to a church that finds itself absolutely surrounded by crazy, mean people. Anyone relate with that in the room? And Paul's like this, keep loving them. Keep loving them. Keep loving them. He actually says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, go back and read it. It's in verse 12. He's like this. He's like, I implore you. That's Paul. It's like Paul on bended knee saying, I beseech you, I beg you by the mercies of God to increase in your love towards them. 
That, that's, who, that's who David, coming out of this experience and walking in faith out of the cave of his crazy depressions and fears and worries, is determined to be one who is going to pursue peace and practice, practice love. Drop the drama. Drop the list that you have running in your brain that justifies why that person in your life doesn't deserve your love. And love them. It can't be lost on us. I love Francis Chan's book, Crazy Love. It's time for some crazy love and some crazy pursuing of peace when all is going to pot around you. These guys from Thessalonica were not nice guys. And, and for Paul to say that, it's just sort of like, for some of you in the room, it's like head scratching crazy. But it's a greater crazy. I mean, what's your option? These guys from Thessalonica, incidentally, when you read about it in Acts chapter 17, they got like pitchforks and torches. And they are marching to Jason's house where Paul happens to be staying. And they kick down the door and they're like, where's the guy, man? We're going to tar and feather him, man. We're killing him right now. And they have to slip Paul out. And he runs to the next town. He gets to the next town and he's like, who I can breathe? I'm safe here. Only to realize all the guys from Thessalonica with pitchforks and with torches have followed him to the next town. Read about it. That's the book of Acts. And he's like, begging the church to continue loving those types. You got a neighbor like that. You got an ex-partner like that. I know he royally screwed you. You got an ex-husband like that. But the moment we stop pursuing peace and practicing love, we ought to close up shop. Because that's what makes Christianity different. And it can't be a then faith. It's got to be a now faith. And the fourth thing he does is he positions himself with his full weight to possess the fruit that's promised. He positions himself full weight, the full weight of his faith. Listen, full weight to possess the fruit in his life that's been missing but is promised. Now, where's the fruit? Now, where's the fruit to be found? Because a lot of us are a little too afraid of heights to be calling out as to where the fruit is found. Because if we have to climb the tree, we're going to stay as close to the trunk as we possibly can with both hands around the biggest branch. But where's the fruit? And here David is saying, as crazy as it sounds, for some of you right now, you're looking at me like, you are crazy. You want me out on the limb? I want you pursuing peace and practicing love like crazy. I want you positioning yourself out on the limb like crazy because that's where the promised fruit is to be found. God's not playing it safe with Moses. He's like, uh, yeah, I know you stutter, but I'm sending you to go speak to Pharaoh. That's like out on the limb, Lord. Can I send him a text? <laughs> Does the same thing with Daniel. I'm calling you to go public in your prayer time, and I want to see the shutters of your windows open. And not keeping this like a private thing that not even your closest neighbor knows where you are right now. He's like, go public and magnify the Lord with me. Even in the lion's den, I will be with you. Position yourself to be secure in my protection and provision and position yourself to receive and possess the fruitful life that is promised. Guys, living for ourselves for another day is insanity. Far too many of us have gotten wrapped up into nothing as being more important than our likes and our rights and our identities and our reputations. And all that is to be exchanged for what you're about to receive from the communion table. 
an opportunity of just laying down the crazy and saying, Lord, what I am exchanging with you today is what you have accomplished for me. The reason you can pick up your cross is because you've laid down your sin. The reason that you have faith for tomorrow is because you've surrendered today. And in that beauty and in that freedom, I invite you to stand with us and to sing to the glory of his name, Jehovah Jireh. And when we've all received the bread and the cup of juice that represents the greatest love that has ever been expressed to you in the history of your life, with hearts that are overflowing with praise and gratitude and thanksgiving. We will give him glory in our obedience to leave here with a crazy heart to be his people and shine our lights for his glory more now than ever before in Jesus' name. Amen? Come on, let's sing it out.